Over the last 70 years, Toyota has sold more than 10 million Land Cruisers worldwide, and almost 12% of those have been in Australia. But with the 70 Series Land Cruiser, 1.13 million total sales across 37 years, and one in five of those have been here. So that's probably why Toyota has chosen the 70 Series Land Cruiser to be the 70th anniversary vehicle for the Land Cruiser nameplate. And that's what this car is about. 70 years of Land Cruiser. Anyone familiar with the LC76 wagon can tell that this is the 70th anniversary because the changes are pretty distinctive, but I'll go through those in a moment. First, a little bit of a history lesson about the 70 series Land Cruiser. It was first unveiled in late 1984, which means it's been around for 37 years. There are a couple of cars that are older than this currently on sale around the world, but they're all fairly peripheral, whereas this is still quite a popular car in this country alone, so it's certainly the oldest car on sale in Australia. It has had a few quite considerable updates over time, although they have been spread across a long period of time. So there have been a lot of different variants, different wheelbases, four and six cylinder engines. This wagon didn't appear till some years after the car went on sale, and then the changes started to happen somewhere around the late 90s. It got front coil springs in 1999 for its front live axle instead of leaf springs, though it still has leaf springs on the back suspension. It got a 4.5 litre single turbo V8 in 2007, which actually changed a lot of the look of the front of the car, made it a little bit more bulgy to fit that new powertrain in this vehicle, although it still does have quite a lot of the original heritage look about it, but it is not the same as the 84 car. In 2009, it got twin airbags, which meant it got a completely different dashboard. And in 2012, it got anti-lock brakes, which is a nice thing to have. In 2016, it had its last major rejig, which was based around safety, mainly focused on the single cab cab chassis because that's the vehicle that sells more than 50% in Australia. This wagon is actually more of a lifestyle option and it is more peripheral than that or the dual cab cab chassis or the long wheelbase trip carrier. So there's four variants on sale, this being the least popular of those. Now for the 70th anniversary, this actually has a bunch of retro stuff and I think it works really well. The normal GXL wagon to me looks a little bit chintzy with its two-tone, whereas I feel like this with its black bumpers, black wheel arches, black bezel headlamps, the black grille with the Toyota lettering, it even has LED fog lights with little LED daytime running lights now, although the huge circular headlamps are very yellow in halogen and work pretty well so no picking on the halogen there but it is quite obviously the heritage edition on the left hand side of the 70th anniversary we have this quite cool toyota land cruiser badge here that's not a direct rip off from the 60s wagon but it is very similar and really cool it's not on the driver's side because we've got a snorkel so only the passenger gets that but i do really like it I like the darkened alloy wheels too. They're 16 inch alloys as per the normal GXL wagon. The troop carrier has 16s, but they're very skinny and tall profile steelies. These are much sportier looking. The rest of the car is kind of the same as well. It does have this little 70th anniversary badge on both sides of the seat pillar on the back. These wheel arches are all darkened, which again, look really good on it. And at the back, it's kind of pretty much the same story. At the back, the darkened theme continues darker rear bumper bar, near black end bumper caps. We've got the dark and 16 inch alloy on the barn doors at the back, but it does give it a little bit more of a chic look than the slightly chintzy GXL normal wagon. Let us know what you think, that's just my opinion, but I think this looks substantially better. The 70th anniversary does come in three colors. This one is called Merlot Red. It also comes in Sandy Torp and French Vanilla. One of those being quite a cool retro beige Although I think this one looks probably better. There are 600 examples of these coming to Australia, launched in September 2021. And of that 600, 320 are the dual cab cab chassis, 200 are the single cab cab chassis, and 80 are the wagon. So this is the rarest and arguably the most useful of the lot, depending on what you do. Here at the back here, this is no different to generations of 70 series Land Cruiser. So we have a pair of asymmetric barn doors opening up to a really quite massive 
load area. Now the luggage area in the LC76 wagon is huge, which Toyota does not claim a literage amount for, but you don't need to be a rocket surgeon to work out that that is a lot of space. It is pretty rudimentary, but that's what this vehicle is. So it's not really trying to disguise anything with luxury, although it is carpeted and it does have four tie down points, none of which are like ones in modern cars. They're just simple little pieces of metal that you can tie luggage down with simple and useful. Also in here we have little pop out rear windows which I'd imagine you could use to flow air through or not let dust get in the cabin although this is a very well sealed car you really need to slam the doors so the LC76 wagon must be good at keeping out red dirt which is the enemy of anyone in Australia's outback. Here we have a little cap for the rear washer fluid, there we have a little flap for the jack for the car and here we have these two delightful dual cone speakers which form a part of its four speaker stereo which as we shall discover is very much an antique as well. Like many older Japanese cars, the Land Cruiser 70 series still has a little sticker here to tell you how to fold the back seat, which I think is rather quaint. Interestingly, it's actually got the instructions in Arabic as well as in English, which really focuses on who the most important markets are for this car. Now, there are a couple of easy things to do. The first is you need to take the headrest out or it won't go down. So that's pretty easily done. Voila. The second is to flip this little lever here so the backrest goes down and the third is to pull this one on the side and it tips forward. And while it doesn't look particularly space efficient because this is a separate chassis four drive with a pretty high floor, it does have a little clip built in the back here to bolt onto a little hook on the back floor to hold it in place and that is huge. Going through the features list inside an LC76 wagon is a little bit like reading a 1980s brochure because it has things that used to be kind of luxurious but are now accepted in everywhere but it's kind of all this car really has it has things like power steering it has a power aerial here it has a central locking switch over here it has four power windows which have a little piano black surround in the 70th anniversary version but only the driver has an auto and it's only auto going down. This 70th anniversary does include a few extras that are really, really crucial to making this a more habitable place. And that is all of this here. Previously, the LC76 just had this little tacked on cup holder here that looked like something that you bought off wish.com. Whereas now it's sort of incorporated into this paneling here with this really cool Toyota Land Cruiser plaque with the same 60s font as the one on the outside front mudguard that then flows into a little felt line tray here. We've got a pair of extra cup holders here. We've got two 2.1 amp USB ports there and another two here for the back seat plus a little tray here. But things that are like this, where it seems like something that would be crucial to a car that's quite a utility focused vehicle, don't really fit anywhere. The driver just has this little thin map pocket because this is quite a narrow bodied car there is a cup holder over there, but it only takes a 600 mil bottle. This can't go there or there or there. It needs to go here. Now the general architecture in here was essentially set in 2009 when it got twin airbags. Although the current airbag in the latest LC76 is much more attractive than the hideous wheel it had 13 years ago. But the architecture is sort of set up to make it easy to switch between left and right hand drive rather than having quite a cool aesthetic. If you Google what the 1980s 70 series looked like inside, it had sort of asymmetric eyeball air vents and exposed little fake little screw nut things, it had really cool old retro Toyota dials, really cool old retro Toyota steering wheel and just looked really quite great. Whereas this is all probably a little bit too generic, albeit embellished in the 70 series model. Now the one thing that seems to be carried over from the past is the HVAC panel here, which is very 1980s and looks very similar to what it had when it was new, which means lever adjustment for the temperature control, the fresh air, the air direction. It's got a little double dial thing here, for one for the air conditioning and one for the fan. And all of that works really intuitively and well. What was wrong with that to begin with? The other things in here, like just a little ashtray, cigarette lighter, all that stuff, is all very much 1980s. The 70th anniversary model does add a few extras. 
Among those is these sort of piano black sections here around the new stereo. This stereo being new for 2021 for this model because it now incorporates navigation and has a little USB port here which you can plug in for the phone and Bluetooth and music and stuff. Although we'll talk about that in a minute because it's not very good. The 70th anniversary also has a little gold badge here. It has this glossy wood stuff here and around here and across the top of the steering wheel. And I don't think any of these wood things really sort of suit what this sort of vehicle is. I kind of wish they were metal because I grew up in a 70s Land Cruiser interior and I know how much metal that had. It was everything, that huge big black steering wheel. And I feel like this is trying a little bit too hard to be luxurious and it's not really. Although I do love all of this new stuff. As for the stereo, well, it's also stuck in the 1980s. It's four dual cone speakers. I can see two little sections up here. I reckon they could have put two tweeters in and they could definitely have put bigger speakers in the back, but it just, it sounds okay if you're listening to classical music or ambient music, but if you're listening to anything with a decent amount of bass, you'll need to keep the volume really low and it'll be completely drowned out by the wind noise from the snorkel and the rear view mirrors. As for the driving position, these seats have never been known to give really good long distance comfort. They're not as uncomfortable as the outer back pair and they're better with this premium black upholstery in this 70th anniversary model, which is actually just vinyl with perforated centers, but they do have less give than the cloth ones. So they're more comfortable than the standard seats in this car, although they're just not really set up for long distance motoring. The best part about them is, is that you can just lift them out and bolt in an aftermarket seat because they don't have any side airbags or anything. There's only two airbags in this car. So that means that upgrading something like that is a piece of piss, but these are sort of really not for long distance motoring. That said, sitting here behind the steering wheel, it's really not so bad. My right knee is pressing into the power window switches, which probably weren't designed to be there to begin with, I would bet. There's a left foot rest, but my foot is at a bit of an angle. The seat is not really too bad in relation to the steering wheel, and the vision is stunning out the window over that big, tall inner cooler scoop through these very slightly curved glass. But after a while, you find yourself resting on the top of the door because that armrest doesn't do anything and kind of looking for something here, which doesn't exist. One thing you can do to make up for the lack of an armrest is hold onto the gear lever, just like you would in a Land Cruiser in the past. And also, because we're in a 70 series, we also have the little lever down here, which is for high range and low range, because this is a proper four-wheel drive with front and rear live axles and locking front and rear diffs. One charming piece of antiquity that the back seat shares with the front is this, the window line. The vision in here is fabulous. Even though it feels narrow in the cabin, you have such a great field of view. This 70th anniversary with these premium seats does have these different netted map pockets at the back and does give a little bit more of a sense of luxury. We've also got the little piano black panels around the power window switches in the doors, two-tone upholstery, this perforated premium trim, which is just vinyl. But what the back seat shares with the normal GXL is that it's just not very comfortable. Like this seat out here, I feel like I'm sort of slumped out on the edge. I'm sitting a little bit askew. Uh, the backrest does fold down, but it only has one position and I don't feel like it's the right position. And when the most comfortable seat in this car is actually this seat, because the center middle seat has better padding and better support than the outer seats, you kind of have to go, something's not quite right here. Especially when the seat belt for the middle seat is a lap belt, which is fine in a 60s classic car like I own, but probably not in a brand new car in 2022. Now, we also have little ashtrays in the back doors, which I think are also quite cool, although you need to be quite dexterous at ashing down there because it's a long way down. This 70th anniversary, now that it has this center console on the front, does have a pair of 2.1 amp USB chargers that can be accessed from back here, but I kind of feel like that's not quite the point. I kind of wish that they had spent a bit more money upgrading the comfort of this seat 
than doing other little things like that. We also have a pair of grab handles, one in the roof here that's sort of just fixed in position, old school, and we have this sort of tacked on B-pillar one here, which is really quite important because getting in and out of the back seat in the LC76 wagon is not necessarily easy and certainly not without this. You need to pull yourself past the rear door, which is quite small and only opens to about a 45-ish degree angle Okay, maybe 60 degrees, and then use this to yank yourself in. Do all that well and it's easy. Don't do that properly and it's a bit of a struggle. If you did want to fit three baby seats in the rear of this car though, it does have three top tether anchorage points above the rear barn doors on the back of the roof line. The combined fuel consumption figure for the Toyota Land Cruiser LC76 wagon is 10.7 litres per 100 kilometres. However, if you drive on the freeway like we have to here in the Penrose National Park, you'll be using considerably more than that and relying on its 130 litre tank. The warranty for Toyota in Australia is five years or unlimited kilometres with a seven year unlimited kilometre warranty for rust or perforation. The servicing for the LC76 is every six months or 10,000 kilometres just like it is on a Land Cruiser 300 series with each service capped at $375. Meaning that across five years or 100,000 kilometres of motoring, you'll be paying $3,750 to service this car. Over the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer paid $1,263 to comprehensively insure a Toyota Land Cruiser. However, everybody's situation is different and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account like where you live, your driving history, and whether you garage your car. If you like this four-wheel drive, chasing cars can help you take the next step. If you'd like to organize a test drive or download a brochure, please click on the link below the video. I feel like you have to preface any description of the dynamics of an LC76 wagon by saying that this vehicle is bought for multiple reasons and one of those is not its on-road dynamics. It is bought by people because it is extremely durable by having two live axles front and back, front and rear locking differentials as I've already mentioned, and a really, really tractable and torquey V8 diesel that this is a supreme off-road bash around car. It does an exceptional job in those instances and it can be relied upon by people to get them out of situations that not other SUVs and plenty of other four-wheel drives won't. However, it does have its limitations starting with the seat like I'd mentioned before. It just has simple lever adjustment, backrest and base and that can be junked and easily replaced. And likewise the suspension because the setup in this car is really quite stiff. It's sort of designed to be able to match the 3,500 kilo braked towing capacity and it's also designed to handle rough stuff. And I actually think that the LC76 is a bit more comfortable getting flogged off-road on really bumpy roads than it is juddering about on bitumen like we're doing right now on a typical Aussie country road doing 90 kilometers an hour. At which point I can hear quite a lot of wind noise from the snorkel outside and from these very portrait shaped ring mirrors. The thing is, over the years, the LC76 wagon and other 70 series variants have all been honed pretty nicely to actually do a surprisingly good job given what they're working with, which is a 37 year old car with not a whole lot of stuff designed to be driven on road. And I think if you drive the 70th anniversary wagon with deference to its size, its height and its weight, we've weighted and it's 2,214 kilos. So it is not a lightweight car by any means and it doesn't have a whole lot of stuff in it really. Then you can hustle this car quite quickly. And when I say car, I'm sorry, I know it's a four wheel drive, but I'll say vehicle because this is absolutely not a car. As long as you're willing to push the LC76 inside its own limitations and your own, then you can hustle quite quickly. But the thing about this spec is on those quite chunky 16 inch alloy wheels with those knobbly tires is that it sort of picks up a lot of bumps on the road more than the narrower and much taller profile wheels that are on the Workmate variants and older troop carriers and stuff like that that are thinner and running on 95 series profile tires 
that do a lot better job of soaking up the bumps on the road. And the troop carrier having 250 millimetres more wheelbase length means that it is inherently more comfortable because it has a longer period of time between the bump hitting the front axle and hitting the back axle. So there are periods where you're cornering the LC76 and it's really jumping around quite a lot and that is exacerbated by the steering because we have a 12.6 metre turning circle here with recirculating ball steering and 4.4 turns lock to lock. So the steering itself is often the limitation on a twisty road and going quickly with the LC76 because you just can't keep up with it. Like, as long as you're measured in the way you're guiding it, it's fine, but if this is not a quick steering car by any means. I can do this and the car's not even moving on the road. So, yeah, you know, it's not about that though, I get that. It is about absorbing road shock and doing other things and it does that reasonably well. The ESC tune in the car is pretty good too. We drove it off-road today doing stuff and we just left it in rear-wheel drive. And it actually did a pretty good job of handling that because the ESC was just nibbling away at the edges, just keeping it on song, really not even requiring to go into four-wheel drive high, let alone low range. This car has a lot of bandwidth in that respect, but it doesn't have very many other safety systems. It has kind of almost nothing. It has what we would have accepted as the standard in the early 2000s. So twin airbags, it now has a seatbelt pretensioner, it has electronic brake force distribution, it has brake assist, it has hill start assist, uh, it has, now has cruise control, which it's only had since 2016. Things like that really don't mean a whole lot these days. It doesn't have any kind of lane assistance, which some of us are probably quite happy about, but it doesn't have a rear camera, even with this new 6.1 inch screen. It doesn't have any rear parking sensors. And so you're completely reliant on your own sense of where its rear end is and the size of these mirrors on the outside, not on any kind of electronic stuff, which is actually what people are used to these days. But the heart of the LC76 wagon is its drivetrain and that is the 4.5 litre single turbo V8 diesel with a five speed manual transmission and I kind of wish that it had six gears. The fifth in this car actually is 15% taller than it was in 2016 so even with the taller gear it's still doing 2500 revs at an indicated 120 k's an hour which is quite a lot when you consider that maximum power is only 3400 rpm and that's 151 kilowatts. That's one kilowatt more than the 2.8 litre turbo diesel in a Hilux, and this is a 4.5. So that goes to show just how understressed and conservatively tuned this engine is. And I think that kind of hampers the LC76 a little bit. Where it's in its element is in second gear. You don't even need to use first around town, you just use second. In fact, I even tried third and it's probably a, a step too far, but you can use second gear and it just gives this lovely surge up through the 2000s, up past maximum power and probably to around four grand. It will go to four and a half thousand revs, but that's sort of academic really. It just gives it a little bit of headroom. It doesn't really produce much power there. The core of the drivetrain in this car is the torque. 430 newton meters isn't anything amazing, but it's produced from 1200 RPM to 3200 RPM. That is outstanding for a diesel, really, that's been around as long as this, which is quite some time. And you can pull any gear from about 800 RPM. So you can go into fourth at 800, and it's just effortless, 40 k's an hour. You can go to fifth at well under urban speed limits, which is why only having five gears seems to be such a wasted opportunity. Like it could have much taller gears and be much better at cruising along on the freeway and be much more economical. But it does mean that in its chosen environment, which is off-road or doing the grey nomad thing, towing a large caravan, a large boat and that sort of stuff at its actual preferred gait, which is about 80 to 100 k's an hour. We're doing just, we're doing 85 right now. And it's at 1700 RPM. This is perfect because it's not at the point where the wind noise starts to overcome the general comfort. And even though the ride is still juddering and still annoying, it's not as bad as it is when you're going faster. At 115, 120 on the freeway, which is a bit over 110, true, there is 
a noise from the engine that is not unpleasant, but it does sound a little bit like a caricature of a coal-fired power station. It's like burbling away up front, roaring away even. It almost sounds like a washing machine on spin cycle. That's actually quite ever-present and that is joined by all the wind noise. So as a cross-country tour, this insipid little stereo with its pathetic little dual cone speakers is not going to drown out the sound of the engine humming away loudly or any of the wind noise in this car. You'll need to add that on your list of aftermarket stuff. So, new seat, chosen suspension tune, there are multiple options you can choose from. Some people go softer because they want to travel more. Some people go stiffer and lift because they want to do more off-roading. It does have all those options. All those things are common modifications on a 76 series wagon. And you also have the transmission. People actually fit General Motors six-speed automatics to this. But that is not really the point of assessing this for chasing cars. This is a brand new car, straight out of the box, and nearly $80,000 that looks really good and has a really great level of antiquated charm about it. And that's what we're assessing, what you buy from the Toyota showroom floor. We're not assessing a modified car here that could cop tens of thousands of dollars worth of extras. We're just talking about what's here. And even though it can be fun, and it actually corners surprisingly well, way better than the old generation Mercedes G-Wagon. That's how good this is, if not quite as good perhaps as the very last of the Land Rover Defender's original style. Then there's still a lot to like, but there's also a lot to forgive. As a special edition, the 70th anniversary LC76 wagon, I reckon is a real success. It actually looks super cool like look at it it's actually got drls which adds a level of safety it has much more utility inside and it's actually more comfortable than the cloth seat version that it's based upon but this is just the beginning of what you can do with your 70 series wagon this is really the standard car with the standard dampers that aren't that great with the standard seats that aren't that great and with the standard engine that's kind of choked it's just waiting to be modified so for $78,500, this is a little bit of a blank canvas and you need to be willing to do that stuff if you really want to get the best out of this four drive because this has so much potential. In my written road test, I actually gave this car five and a half stars out of 10. And I know that might seem really picky, but I'm assessing a brand new car that is here in this form as it is. And it is a flawed car, lovable as it may be. But as it stands, it's just a little bit too unrefined. It's a little bit too uncomfortable. And I will tell you now that the best 70 series you can buy, in my opinion, is the Troop Carrier and not this. Because with its 95 series tires, with its 250 millimeter longer wheelbase, and just with a general amount of more real utility about it, I think that is truer to the Land Cruiser heritage and celebrating the 70 years of this nameplate than this sort of bedazzled wagon for all of its visual charm. If you haven't subscribed, please do sub below the video, hit the notification bell, and tell us what you think about the 70th anniversary 76 series Land Cruiser wagon or about chasing cars. Thanks for watching.